The college campus, calm, quiet, steeped in tradition. Yesterday. Today, young people have discovered this is not the best of all possible worlds. They have discovered that protest can change it. This is Columbia University in 1968. It could be any one of a hundred others. Here the protest was against the school's involvement in the machinery of war, against the traditional disregard for faculty and student opinion by a powerful administration, against the building of a gymnasium on land which many felt could better serve the school's black neighbors. It is a part of the universal protest by the young against doing things in the same old incomprehensible way. We're here to pro protest the racist policies of this university. Columbia has consistently refused to alter these policies when the community has used normal means of protest. So we escalate in the walk. We are therefore using this dramatic means of protest to highlight the following four demands. We might increase the list. <coughs> Number one, the stopping of the construction of the gym. Amen. And I still maintain the position that if you build it up, people in Harlem should blow it up. Number two, dropping of the charges against all persons involved in demonstrations against the gym. Number three, breaking of all faculty and administrative ties with IDA. Number four, general amnesty for all the students involved. The university administration is handling the crisis at Columbia, just as the federal administration is handling the rebellion on the part of black people for their own liberation. A military solution to a set of social and political problems. We have protested that use of the university in the past. We have protested the use of the university to support the war in Vietnam by again discovering military means to resolve social and political problems and we have found that our own administration has responded in exactly the same way. Our power is with our student power. And the faculty has proven in the past week that they have no power. The only way they can get power against this administration is by supporting us. And we're not going to let them bust the movement because we think not only are we important, but this movement is important for what it fights for. When we stand up and say the students of Columbia University will not be students in a university that exploits black people, that's an important statement, and we're not going to let anyone turn us around. It's not only an SDS demonstration as it had been played in the, in the press. In other words, the press has deliberately been trying to black out the black people's protest because they know they are in Harlem. Harlem is right over here, and black people are preparing in Harlem to come and deal with Columbia University. Now, the administration, the deans really blew their cools when they let these guys stay in there the first day. They should have moved them out the very first day because they, because they let Cicero Wilson get on the phone and call up 75 of his goons from down in Harlem, and now it's completely out of hand. They threw, all the, they threw all the white guys out of the building, all the SDS kids. So the SDS kids figured, gee, we gotta stay in the picture somehow, let's go seize a bunch of other buildings. So we're gonna let Columbia know that if they don't wanna deal with the brothers in here, they're gonna deal with the brothers on the street. <laughs> I mean, you know, 50, maybe 75 guys over there in Harlem, and from, and from Harlem in the Hamilton Hall, holding the dean, and our parents pick up the papers, and it's all they see is Columbia students, and they figure, Jesus, what kind of a campus do you go to? What kind of a school is that? When a person pays up to $4,000 a year to go to an institution, you know, you tend to get a little mad when somebody takes that right away from you. President Kirk should take just action and maybe step on these kids a little bit. I would ask the chairman of the Columbia trustees to call a special meeting to consider 
the college faculty's recommendation that the trustees consider suspending the construction of the gymnasium and consider inviting the mayor to designate a group to meet with the university on the gymnasium question. Columbia University continues to hope that Hamilton Hall and Lowe Library and other buildings will be vacated without calling on police assistance. And obviously, we earnestly hope that the efforts of the faculty and the students and the administration may produce a peaceful and a rational solution to this current situation. I have this feeling that the, the majority opinion uh, is not with the strike. I, I really think that after the emotionalism of all this cool down in the next day or two, people will be going back to class. And uh, so I don't think they can pull off a strike. Well, I'm not really sure what it's gonna, going to accomplish. I think if things got back to normal, maybe more would be accomplished in the end. I think that the administration is going to have to come out of its ivory tower and show that it cares about the student body and show that it cares about the, the university. I do not believe that the educational process has truly been disrupted by this. I think it's just beginning. You're headed right towards what most of the political philosophers agree on, and that is that man in a state of nature is every man against every man. Well, if you want to get your papers, you help us get these people out of here, and then you'll be doing something you, you constructive. Know, I'm, I'm just another, I'm trying to get I'm just another scholar, if that's all. To the security office. And I believe in academic freedom. Well, there are no longer any innocent individuals in this thing. We're all in it together. We have to get the students to understand that they are completely disrupting academic freedom and that they are not furthering any idealistic goals by such behavior. And I'm here today because as a faculty member, I think it's my duty to help get this situation cleared up. Every once in a while, the, the negotiation, the faculty meeting has to be broken up, adjourned as it was two or three times last night in order to come outside, in order to try to prevent a confrontation from taking place which would result in violence. Maybe a little violence would cure the situation. Who knows? Look at that. That's what the cops did. When we found out that Grace and Kirk had called to have cops come in, we stood in front of Lowe Library with our arms locked, faculty and students singing, we shall overcome, we shall not be moved. Well, I was with a group of faculty that had put itself in front of the steps at Fairweather Hall. The police came over and lined up in front of us. They read the charge that we were being charged with criminal trespass. Would we please leave? They read that twice and gave us a few minutes. When we did not leave, the police in front of uh, me parted and the tactical patrol force came up with their helmets on and they formed the flying wedge and moved right through us, pushing us aside. Well, I saw one policeman chasing a rather plump girl who uh, really couldn't even run and who was doing nothing but running away from him. He dodged her the way, you, the way you tease a bull before you kill it. And when she gave up, he went and smashed her over the head with a club. I actually seen them hit women, uh, you know, girls. I mean, girls, what, what can a girl do against the billy club, right? We have been invaded by over a thousand policemen. Our students have suffered the blows of fists, of clubs. They have been run at by horses, herded as if they were sheep, chased out of the campus, chased down Broadway. Our faculty have received bloody noses, bloody heads, black eyes. They have been kicked. They have been poked at. They have been subject to every conceivable indignity on a part of an administration that has proved itself utterly incapable of maintaining order. Reports as of early this morning indicate extensive damage in seven buildings consisting mainly of broken windows and the results of fires set by the demonstrators. The broken windows were caused by the throwing of over 100 bricks which had been dug out of the campus walkways. Some of the fires were set by burning manuscripts and other valuable and I'm sure in some cases irreplaceable papers taken from professors' offices. Now, gentlemen, in case there remains any doubt in anyone's mind about the motivation behind last night's action, the strike committee's statement early this morning clearly demonstrates that there is a political action, the political action that goes far beyond their grievances with the university. And they called for citywide support and when they asked for risings on other university campuses throughout the country, they showed the true nature of their objectives. 
And the fundamental reason why the university's officials were compelled on April 30 to call in the police to clear the demonstrators from the occupied buildings was that the overwhelming majority of our faculty and students were being forcibly prevented by a small minority from pursuing their normal academic uh, activities. And the infinitely precious academic freedom of faculty members and students obviously cannot be exercised if the university is subjected to further riotous demonstrations, occupations of buildings, and the violence and wanton vandalism of the kind that occurred on this campus last night. I believe these people have the right to protest against something they don't believe in, but I don't believe they have the right to ruin a campus or destroy a building in the way they did here. I think that a few students have taken it upon themselves to uh, put across their ideas and their beliefs on, on a majority in an illegal manner. And I don't I have no sympathy for them, and I think that uh, well, I think that they should all be kicked out of school, personally. The issue on amnesty is a lot bigger than Columbia. The question of whether a small minority of students may destroy an academic community and the means of its existence goes to the very heart of university and civilized life in the United States. We are not prepared to give on that point. The point is that the faculty has admitted to a very large extent that the students in the buildings are fundamentally right. They've said that the gym must stop. Mayor Lindsay has pretty much agreed to this. They've said that IDA, the Institute for Defense Analysis, may not have a place on the campus. At least they've, they've gone that far. Now these were the basic issues. They've also agreed that students don't have power, that faculty doesn't have power on this campus. This is why this, the possibility of this tripartite commission uh, is being uh, talked around right now. Now, if they agree on the issues, and if they agree that there was no way by which students could have voiced their grievances before, because there was no such tripartite commission before, then why are they against amnesty? If people are right, they're right. You want to break the law? Fine. You have moral pr objection? Fine. But let's be prepared to pay the punishment. We feel that the administration is culpable. We have, we have said that from the beginning. We do not feel that the actions that we took starting on April 23rd, the occupations of the buildings, were culpable given the fact that this administration, through its authoritative decision-making, its authoritative structures, its, its affiliation with war effort, its institutional racism. This administration was bankrupt. It was illegitimate as far as we were concerned. But there's nothing wrong with civil disobedience if somebody violates one's own, if a law violates one's own personal moral ethic. All right, break the law, but one has to assume the responsibility for one's actions, as did Thoreau and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and anybody that's ever practiced civil disobedience. These people didn't wanna, did not assume responsibility, and as a result, they were not trying to change the law, they were trying to abolish laws per se, the university per se. And for that, for that reason, amnesty can never be granted to them. I feel the consequences of amnesty are far more serious than the consequences of using the police. I think Grayson Kirk has done the impossible. He's united the whole student body, both left and right, against him. And the one thing we have to know is that we can never let what happened again. And the only way we can be sure of that is that the students of this university and the faculty of this university have the power to make sure that doesn't happen. Without the power, we're dead. I think the faculty have realized that they have to take an active role in the university in the formulation of policy. And I think the administration is going to have to realize that it's going to have to give it to them. I think it's time to make the university a community of scholars, the faculty and the students, and to make the major decisions concerning IDA, concerning the CIA, and concerning community questions such as the gymnasium in Harlem within the faculty and within the student body, and they determining the policy for the university, the administrators then carrying out the policy as determined by them. And we've always had a lot of free speech on this campus. That's the one thing I think we're all ready to admit. The problem is we've had a dearth of action. We've all been able to talk, but we haven't gotten much action from the administration. And these people in the buildings, called them vigilantes, they went out and they decided to take some action. And the point is that now, the faculty and very many other students agree with them. There can be no education and no thought that is divorced from action. That we learn through what we do, and even if we make mistakes, that is part of learning. I think we can become a university community, which is something that we were not as a result of what has happened here in the past few days.